Key Africans Unlocked Season 1, Episode 1. And let's be upfront, you know how it goes with pilot episodes, but we were determined to put our best foot forward first. And so our first guest was a guy we've got a lot of respect for because he's been in the podcast game longer than we have. And his name is Andile Masuku. I met Andile on Twitter, incidentally. Uh, somebody tagged he and I and uh, hashtagged voiceover kings or something. And I thought, who's this guy? So I did what any sane person would do. I looked him up. Turned out to be a great guy. And we've been mates for years. And so it was a great honor for Zubz and I on our inaugural episode of Key Africans Unlocked to host the amazing Andile Masuku. Andile, welcome, bro. Thank you, man. It's Thank good you. to see you here. Last time we sat with Andile, we were planning to have this day. Hey, <laughs> and you guys did it too, because people yeah. say, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that, and then, ah. Uh, nothing out. happens. Yeah, so, well done to well, you guys, man. Thank you, man. Uh, thanks for availing yourself, not just for that pre-consultation, oh. but for today. Oh, so. you're making this a lot more than it was, but yeah, you guys had the idea, you, you were well on your way, so well done. Excellent. Cool. Looking forward to chat to you. One of the reasons that I'm excited about chatting to Andile is because he's a live wire. Like, like <laughs> I'm serious. Each time you see Andile, he just looks like there's a lot going on. You know, he's, he's juggling things. And so oh, you, you're almost like an onion. It's interesting to peel off the layers and like, oh, he does this as well. He does that as well. So it'll be interesting in this chat to find out more uh, about you and what you're up to. I hope everyone, well, everyone listening cares to start, <laughs> but um, I'm glad you two do. It's well, affirming. You guys we, care, we care enough to bring you on Key Africa. Oh, oh, holler back. Can I tell no, you? I'm on it. I'm, on I'm it. sure the guys are wondering exactly what it is he's talking about when he says you juggle a lot. Yeah. In your words, what is it that you do? When someone actually asks you, let's say you're in a social setting yeah. and they're like, yo, so what do you do? Hey, so what do you do? And that's what people do in yeah, Joburg. Yeah. So I kind of default to what's, you know, my, my Twitter bio. <laughs> so I'm a Zimbabwean broadcaster entrepreneur. Okay, that's not my Twitter bio. But anyway, this is pretty much it. I'm a Zimbabwean uh, broadcaster and entrepreneur. And what that means is um, I, I straddle a lot of work within media um a lot of it in front of the mic behind in front of the camera behind a mic also behind the scenes uh probably my most public jobs in media at the moment would be uh as a columnist for a tech columnist for african independent and business report uh business report is essentially the the, the biggest daily business uh, newspaper in south africa african independent goes to the rest of the continent so i write for them um I'm also a fellow at Jam Lab, which is a, a journalism slash new media accelerator. It's a partnership between Wits University and Ryerson University in Canada. So busy with that. I'm executive uh, editor at African Tech Roundup, um, africantechroundup.com. This is where you can find all the content we produce. We basically cover African uh, tech and innovation news across the continent, and we package insights, um, most notably the, the podcast, the African Tech Roundup podcast, which is our marquee product at this stage. But we do a lot of different things as well. We consult as well uh, and uh, partner on events and do quite a few things in that space. Um, and then my wife and I run a gourmet grape juice brand called Latanda, which is um, a certified product of Stellenbosch. We produce two varietals, uh, a Columbar and a, and um, a, 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 what's basically called a Hanapot, a Hanapot grape that we bottle. And uh, yeah, in between that, Chilu knows he and I like run into each other quite often in doing voiceovers. Okay. That's something that all three of us have in common. We, oh, actually, yes, but I've never actually oh, yeah. run into you. Yeah, that's because I'm only I'm fresh in the game. Oh, I'm not like you guys. You guys are like the seasoned vet. You're like a when yeah. You're like he brand. went fresh into the game with like this amount of contracts all of a sudden. Yeah, <laughs> like guys like nailing it. I wish I, I wish my start was as good as yours. Listen, guys, my start didn't start like three years ago. It started like seven, eight years. Ago. Oh, like I've been, yeah, yeah, I just became serious about it like three years ago. But I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward yeah. to being like you guys. Uh, Every yeah. time I, I ask anyone in the space, like when I'm in the voiceover space, and I say, um, "So give me an example of whatever," or they just volunteer examples. Andile comes up all the time. Chilu wow. comes up wow. all the time. You guys are like premier voices wow. out that's, in the country. That's so. nice to know. That's kind. He's a humble man, man. I hear your voice all the time. I do too. But good thing we're talking about beginnings because. We want to find out about how did you land up in in tech and and because that's the world that occupies most of your time. I'm Pretty assuming. much, yeah. I'd say about sixty, maybe some weeks, seventy percent of my time spent covering tech, uh, talking about tech, writing about tech. Um, how did I end up in tech? Well, firstly, you you got you both know this about me. I am, you know, I'm naturally curious about 
pretty much everything. Like you, like leading up to this whole conversation, like there's 20 different things. Like I asked you guys questions about, cause like you said one word in that direction and I wanted to like, Correct. oh, that's interesting. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, I get distracted very easily. So <laughs> <laughs> we'll keep you focused. Don't yeah, worry. Focused. We're really good at that. Yeah. So, but that's part of what gets me vibing and into things that I didn't even realize I was passionate about and stuff like that. So I've always been curious about um, how things work um, in the, in, in terms of like, what makes business work, what makes good businesses great, what makes great businesses amazing and that kind of thing. Um, in, in my, in my days sort of as a broadcaster in the small business space or like entrepreneurship space, every time I'd ask really uh, amazing entrepreneurs on the continent about like what was working for them, what wasn't and the guy kind of thing, there was always a tech component to that or, or, and, and it didn't have to be like a fancy sort of flying car sort of, or self-driving, fancy VR thing. No, no, it was just harnessing a, uh, harnessing technology in a smart way to work efficiently, um, to improve the, you know, the product you delivered and stuff. Like that. So it really was organically, you know, um, as a, as a sort of broadcaster, my brand was really linked to entrepreneurship and SMEs and that kind of thing. But over time, there's no SME that was worth speaking about that succeeds without leveraging technological advancement in some shape or form. And that sort of spun out into all sorts of other things like the world of startups and venture capital and um, where Africa features in the, in the context of like this global explosion that's led by Silicon Valley and all of it's so interesting to me. Right. And, and then the politics of it, the geopolitics of it, the socioeconomics of it, the, you know, that's fascinating because that's storytelling really. And, and again, I'm a storyteller, you know, and so I'm, I'm fascinated with like why why you ended up um, out of all the media that you could have chosen, you chose podcasting out of all of them, and you've done TV, yeah. so you've done a lot. And I mean, this is Africa, right? Yeah. And they always say like the biggest medium in Africa on the content is radio, yeah. right? Yeah. But you've chosen to go with new media. You've chosen to go specifically with the newest of the new media, which would be podcasting. Mm-hmm. Why that? Okay, on one level, it's a future play. It, I'm playing to where everything's going. Which is tough because uh, in as much as we hear a lot about where Africa is in terms of like digital adoption and that kind of thing, we are way behind the curve. I mean, just a simple statistic. I'm, uh, is it the Pew Research uh, 2016 uh, uh, statistic that compares the number of smartphones per, you know, per 10 people in different countries, right? I mean, South Korea leads the world at about nine per 10 people out of every 10 people having a smartphone, uh, America- Nine out of 10 people, that's like 90% of the people they have. Pretty much, right? That's amazing. Isn't that insane? And, and we're talking high end. Really? So smartphones. I mean, so smartphones, right? Smartphones generally are anything that can have the internet on them, right? Um, so that includes even dumb phones that only have Facebook and WhatsApp, right? But when in the context of South Korea, we're talking about nine out of 10 people having like, you know, mid range to the best. Wow. Okay. In, in America, you're looking at about seven. In South Africa, which is like Africa leading in that in, in terms of that statistic, you're looking at at best 3.5, something like that, right? And this includes dumb phones that have basic function, internet function. So in the context of all this, yes, internet is being taken up by our continent and we're changing and Africa's going mobile and stuff like that. And I'm all about that life, right? I'm all about like thinking about where it's all going, how it's going to affect consumption habits in terms of media, how... The, the more people come online and the cheaper, you know, data and the, the access to the web gets, you know, people are going to be curating what they listen to. They won't just be letting a radio station decide or, you know, uh, consuming passively. So podcasting fits very nicely into that trend, which is already taking hold in other parts of the world. Right. So you want to I want to position as a brand that people choose because of value and not something that happened to be on the radio or do you get what I'm saying? Or you almost, you almost, uh, um, you're almost okay with or endure or, um, you know what I mean? You don't hold to like serious account in terms of quality or whatever, just because it's on a radio, it's not costing you anything. So it's fine. Whereas podcasting really the, the sort of tribes you build, the communities you build around podcasting are people who find you because often they've looked for the kind of insight you're delivering. And, and they specifically want that insight, that insight from, from you from specifically. You and yeah. it's an intimate medium right. and you're part of their lives. And 
and that's a branding opportunity that I feel like is really worth pursuing for a lot of people, including myself. So there's that sort of really high end reason why I did it and sort of futuristic. I'm playing for the future. Plus thing. you like your voice and hearing the Do sound you know? of your voice. <laughs> Actually, I you don't. You love so the sound I, of his own voice, basically. No. no. Why does everyone assume that if you're in any kind of creative industry to do with voice, you yeah, love, love the, the sound you, of your voice? I mean, have you ever got that, Chilu? Whenever I, you I do, do it. Once like in a while. Say, oh, once you must love your voice. And you should know better because he's the most, like he cringes every time like he gets a compliment. Uh, uh, you, you, Chilu. The voice of the world. Chilu, the voice, voice Lemba. The uh, come on now. You know, there's like, there's uh, one of the things I look forward to becoming is like a voice of Morgan Freeman type person. Oh, yeah, yeah. But the closest thing to voice of Morgan Freeman I could think of is Chilu, man. Oh, no, no, it's no. The voice of Dude, Morgan I mean, he is the flippant voice. This, this is me now like deflecting all this attention. Oh, it's about stop, you today. Stop. All right, I want to move on from the, the podcasting yeah, stuff. Yeah, but yeah. before we do, I just want to find out what at least the podcasting aspect of your your hustle if i can call it that because i mean it is ultimately yeah. like a, a hustle right that, yeah, that, that we have to what has that specifically taught you about yourself so in answering that question i'll actually dial back a little um we talk about the voice and do i like my voice now so as it happens i used to stutter as a child Really, oh, wow. I had a really bad. My sister used to stutter. Did well. she used to? Mm, go ahead. Yeah, so there's, that that comes with that. You know, that's I want to talk about that. <laughs> you know how my okay. sister got over it? How? Like she say um um and keep hitting on her leg um yeah, um. Yeah. So then she stopped hitting her leg. Now she just says um, and then the arms turn to uh, and then the uh just turn to like a breath, and that's how her mind kind of got over. So, so it's, it's it's a neurological thing happening. Kind of, which, yeah. yeah. What about you, bro? That is some serious like self psyching and. It's over years. I remember her kicking tables. She'd literally smack her leg. Yeah. Wow, that's dope. And okay. it's not like she went for any kind of like speech therapy or whatever. She just figured it out. Just, yeah, yeah. I guess she worked it out. Sure. Okay, see, I want to go into that some more. But anyway. <laughs> no, no, you, your, your starter story better yeah, be good. Pressure's on. No, but so the, the, there's an irony in speaking for a living and being a kid who stuttered, right? And then yeah, of course. about like third grade to about the seventh grade, my family lived in the Philippines. Um, and this is like pre-internet Philippines. This is like 92, 95. This is, Zimbabwe at the time was a great country. And in the Philippines at the time wasn't like the ti- like the sort of Asian tiger it later would become. And so it was rough. It was actually a very traumatic experience. And we were the only Zimbabwean family in the whole country at the time. I mean, their home affairs department let us know. And there were other Africans, of course. But in, in the in the sort of private school we were in, private Christian school we were in, um, we were the only, I, my brother and I were the only, you know, kids of color. So I was an African booty scratcher. I was, you know, chocolate boy. Gods Must Be Crazy was, was popping at the time. And that's pretty much the only reference, not only... Michael Jordan, Michael Jackson, Gods Must Be Crazy. That's pretty much the sum total of black people in the minds of sort of the Filipinos and, you know, it, you know, Asians we were around at the time. And all of those people, you know, we were not particularly athletic. My brother and I, we certainly couldn't sing and we, you know, we, we weren't fair skinned. And yeah, so you must be the Gods Must Be Crazy people, you know? And I couldn't express myself and everything. So to, to sort of psychoanalyze why podcasting has become my sort of medium. Um, it's the medium that allows me to be myself the most. Uh, it allows me to, to, I constantly have like, I'm constantly trying to optimize my, my expression. So I have like three different ways of even the stories playing out in my head and I'm trying to give you the, the best possible one that results in me umming and ooing and eyeing and, and restarting sentences and, and, and television doesn't let you do that. Radio doesn't let you do that because that's unprofessional, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the irony is I grew up, you know, you know, not deifying, but really looking up to like the CNN, you know, news readers and the, and the, and the sort of anchors on, on BBC. And so in my mind, there's the person I'm meant to be in media and there's the kid who never got to tell, you know, express himself and, 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 and not even express himself, but basically tell those kids where to get off and just how amazing where he's from is. And he never got to do that, but he gets to do it now. Do you get what I'm saying? He gets to make that right. He gets to contribute to the narrative. He gets to edit out his ums and ahs if they get too distracting. He doesn't have to alter himself too badly in order to fit a mold or he, he literally gets to be himself. And guess what? Like people seem to, dig that and that's really affirming so that's really i mean it's it's a roundabout way to answer your question 
No, but it's it's it's, it's, it's deep. It's very insightful. And yeah. and what what happens with most times? I mean, people look at us uh, at th- our present stage and kind of think we've figured it out our entire lives. I mean, they'll look at Zub's successful rapper, entrepreneur, uh, recording artist. He consults. He does this and that. And they kind of don't realize that under that there's a journey that got you to to where you are. Yeah, and and similarly, I mean, I know with um, at some point um, you were telling me that you worked at. Um, I, I, I should, maybe I shouldn't say the name of the brand. Uh, you were Sun, Sun Goddess, isn't it? Yeah, Sun Goddess. Yeah, and 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 it was like a, a job which you know helped to establish you where, where you are now in terms of discipline and stuff. But it wasn't a glamorous uh, job, so to speak. No, 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 it was fashion not. Fashion designers, right? South African so, fashion yeah, designer, so a couple, isn't it? A like couple. A, yeah. So my first job, married yeah, couple, not as in a couple as in two. Yes, married couple, like a husband and wife situation. Yeah. So. Uh, Last year of Varsity, I go in big. My boss at the time, who was like, a, uh, he ran the res at at my Varsity, and I was his assistant. I was working at Varsity uh, throughout Varsity, and and I say to him, please, like, if you hear of anything that might suit me, um, I you need to save me from you know what my dad has planned <laughs> for me. What's once, uh, once I finish this degree, which I you know I studied for a business management degree, and my dad was really like he had his mates like setting up like opportunities for me to maybe you know do articles or something crazy. In, in accounting or whatever, and I was like, Lord, please, something else. And Is my dad's po- still alive, by the way. Oh, yeah. Okay, good. Shout out Dr. Leonard. Oh, Dr. Dr. Leonard. Dr. Leonard. Oh, oh, yeah. Shout out Dr. <laughs> Leonard Muscle. Yeah, no, both my parents are actually PhDs. So what? That's a long story. But that, that's actually what we were doing in the Philippines. My dad studied, studied. for his okay, PhD, good. and my mom studied for her first degree in her 40s what? and stuff, and she later. Many many years later, you know, did a PhD with with Stella. Well, you're under pressure. Yeah, not at all. Not at all. Actually, actually, not at all. So anyway, well, kind of, but not at all. Um, so anyway, the what was I talking about? You're talking sun about goddess. sun goddess. Sun goddess. So, so my boss's dad, at while I was at Varsity, was a headmaster at a school in Heidelberg, in 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 the Val, just outside Johannesburg, and they were looking for an accounting teacher. And they fly me in. I'm still at Varsity. They fly me in for this interview so that as soon as you finish, you come and teach for us. I spend the weekend at the school. It's a boarding school. And they like me. I had the job. I'm flying back. So I was hired before I even finished Varsity. I was flying back at the airport. And I'd done an economics paper on the fashion industry. And I'd, and I'd learned about... San Goddess and, yeah. and these guys that were doing yeah, long culture. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Kinsani and then Kinsani. Yeah, uh, you know, uh, yeah, I can't remember. Stone Cherry. Right. Stone Cherry. Yeah. And and how they were doing different things to sort of combat how, you know, China was taking over textiles and stuff like that. They were doing things differently, branding and all that. And I've, I'm bumping to them in, t- in the in the airport. They were put, you know, trying on fragrance or sunglasses or something. Yeah. I push my trolley to the side. I walk up to them. I walk up to them. I'm like, do you guys take interns? They're like, yeah, we do, but we take fashion interns. What do you do? I'm like, well, I'm a business student. Oh, we never had a business student. Let's exchange cards. I'm thinking, oh, that's the kiss of death. Because <laughs> I wanted to be hired on the spot. I was like, I want to be like, sorry, school. I'm not coming. <laughs> no, I wasn't going to do that. I was committed to the school for at least a year. Oh, really? So I kept in touch with them mm. while I was teaching amazing and they invite me for an interview and the interview goes really great but I, I, I thought it went great then half an hour into the interview they're like do you mind stepping outside i'm like what is this i thought this was going great why I am step i being back told- in and they're making me an offer and they're oh, like fantastic okay. so that's how that happened right and then i mean they're easily one of the hardest people ever to work for um uh by the time i left like we weren't getting on and that kind of thing the hardest in the sense of what because um, that's another married couple that's working together. So yeah. look, they've got agency experience. Um, okay. So this, so let me start with what I really learned from them. Like you, you don't attend. Like say, Mrs. Mangliso is speaking to you on the phone and she's not in the office. Like you better have your notebook in front of you, right? Um, I went through in the t- nearly two years I was there, like five, six different note notebooks, really thick ones, because everything oh, you everything like it's unacceptable you don't you don't do a meeting you don't meet a client you don't she calls you over to her office to discuss something you don't just rock up with no notebook and taking notes like so she brought this really this work ethic around like what it what it means to it it was amazing so it was like black black excellence at at play and i had i'd I'd never experienced it like that in in that way i mean i'm obviously watching my parents you know be professionals yes but i'd never experienced like an office full of black folks being run like 
you know, super like, professionally, like super professionally. I thought that was amazing. And everything. but by the time, you know, I left, I mean, we weren't getting on anymore. I, like it was a va- values clash and, you know, you know, I don't want to say too much about them and how, and how you it know, didn't work out in the end. We yeah, don't do they, that out here. Like, yeah, you know, I mean, key Africans unlocked is not they, key Africans being put on blast yeah, and dude. being thrown under the bus. But there was, that's not there, how we roll. That's, that's not how, how we roll we, out here. But there was a Machiavellian vibe to the whole okay. thing that started to feel really out of place. And I spoke up once and from that point on, they were like, this guy speaks too much. Yeah, as you can tell. And shut him down. Yeah, I tried to, I tried to protect someone who I felt was being treated unfairly and, yeah. It went south. And then it was six months later where I was like, I have to leave, you know, I have okay. to leave. And I did. Well, so what I learned there really is that that's where my roller decks in this town filled up. That's where I got access to, because that brand was so hot at the time. Yes, yes, I mean, yes, it's unfortunately not as huge as now, but then, I, I mean, they were, they had like, they were balling. They had four remember maids. I remember that era very well. Traveling, I was helping open stores. I was I was a dude, like the, the magazines were calling us, the yeah. newspapers, the us, the fashion and, shows. And you were, you were the, the point of contact. Yeah, so I was, I, I managed logistics, head of brand. Um, I also trained all the, the uh, all the retail uh, staff when it open a new store, I'd be there, you know, I'd be there to, just to set it up. I would sort of mentor the management, uh, the management of the stores. I would plan all the campaigns around the seasonal campaigns around in-store campaigns. And your network started growing. Oh my word. I would place the ads. I would, I had, by the time I arrived, I was on my own, but I had a team of about four or five of people. I'd help develop products like fragrance that ended up in Red Square uh like manage like fashion weeks and our fashion weeks are like 40 models like it wasn't like it was like 80 looks some some seasons you know it wasn't and i wear with talk of butchin and who owns Torga, like serious like experience and that's how you basically got a feel for joburg for south africa because that's i mean that's interesting those are the kind of networks that end up making you uh, a viable person within the space you know and as somebody who'd been traveling philippines zim that's how you manage to get a foothold on the country i want to move on to the wines man (laughs) <laughs> the non-alcoholic wines. You working with your wife, going from one couple at San Gades to this new couple, Andy and his yeah, wife, yeah. you know, working with these. Oh, yeah. Oh, I hadn't thought of it like that. Like, listen, listen, before we even get into it, oh, let me tell you something. Let me tell you something. Yeah, what's up? We're chilling here saying we're going to talk to Andy about his wine. Yeah. We didn't even know what it tasted like. Oh, my. So what we're going to do now. Oh. We're going to pop a bottle, pop a bottle oh, right here, yeah, right now. So. Oh, so we, snap. We, yeah. <laughs> so you're going to tell us about the grapes you guys used in this thing. Well, your wife, because she's clearly the one who formulated so, this thing. So, yeah. So I'll tell you the story before. Grapes. What are we about to try? So, the, so what are we about to try? Focus on the grapes. Muscat de Alexandria. Thank you. Keep me keep me straight now. Yeah. Muscat de Alexandria is a, is a grape varietal that has its origins in Egypt. It's now widely farmed uh, in the Western Cape. Uh, it's uh, usually called a Hanapot, although really um, there are quite a few different varietals that fall under that, mm-hmm. that sub name. So specifically, it's, it's uh, traditionally uh, used to make uh, fortified wines, mm-hmm. sweets, fortified wines. Mm-hmm. So a, a, a very common one would be a Moscato. Okay. So, uh, the reason it's popular for sweet wines is because as it ripens, it, go- it goes golden. It actually sweetens as it ripens nice. and goes golden. And, um, and basically, yeah, so it makes for, 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 for great, for great sweet wines. So we, we basically harvest and bottle be- at the, the beginning of the season. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we don't allow the grape to, 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 or the sugars in the grape to alcoholize in any way. Before we actually bottle them, can you do that? Yeah, I always thought if you left grapes alone for a while, they'll just Probably, become yeah. wine. You know what I mean? Yes, but that's it. So all wines typically, after it's harvested, that's the the, the grapes actually spend time in a, in a cellar. Okay, look, to, to basically the 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 fermentation process starts even before the grape is crushed or the 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 the, the, uh, the, the skin is removed. So yeah, this wants to become alcohol, but you stop it. Yeah, yeah so you basically bottle, you denied it. It's right <laughs> to be an alcohol. Like, no, look, and you came and said <laughs> you will not be an alcohol. <laughs> in a no, street, I know, you can tell I know. Chilu and I indulge <laughs> in alcohol. Well, so nature will have its way in another year and a half or so. Yeah. In fact, let me say about two years. So you mean if if but but that's not the bottled ones. Like if I get this and put it in my um, wine cellar for a year, 
it won't be like now you 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 know it will become no well if you left it in a, in a wine cellar at the right temperature no it wouldn't turn okay. or turn yeah. as quickly if you left it in the sun however it would pr- it probably, probably turn a turn. lot sooner okay um and also no, no. <laughs> <laughs> and also so there are trace quantities of um of um of sulfites that are sprayed on grapes too, that generally as part of the winemaking process to prevent them from like ripening too quickly as they're on the actual vine and everything. And those trace sulfites end up in the glass and prevent the fermentation process from happening too quickly, right? In some cases, you add some sulfites, right? Limit like trace quantities of sulfites to prevent fermentation from happening. Or in, and in, in the case of this particular product, you have sulfites here, but we also use uh, more natural pre, um, uh, preventative means to, to keep uh, the, the, the fermentation process from going. Okay. Okay. The red is not, so people who know this grape know that it's not a red grape. Mm-hmm. Whenever you drink a red wine, it's because the skins of that grape have been have be, basically the the grapes the juice has been allowed to sit in its own skins. Although the grapes have been allowed mm-hmm. to sit in their own skins, and and the and the color from the grapes have 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 basically passed into the into the liquid. Uh, the the Hunnaport being a white grape, um, the red in this particular drink is actually uh, uh, organic grape skin extract that we added to the, okay. to, to make it red. Interesting. Okay, so we're about to taste it. Right, some so of us have already tasted it. After that lecture. Yeah, when I say some of us, I mean I'm cheers. the only guy who's about to taste this that hasn't tasted it. Cheers, guys. Oh, oh, not. We still cheers. So. My Good. first sip of Latanda. This is nice. Yeah, very nice. It's got like a like a like a grape ties of vibe. Mm-hmm. Yes, um, yes. Very yes, grape ties of right, yeah. vibe. Um, very smooth. So there's like light bubbles in it. Um, the reason I bristle when I hear grape tizer is because one, if you if you if you um, if you drank grape tizer before or after this, yeah. you would see that it's really made a difference. A very big difference. Yeah, grape tizer essentially is essentially a reconstituted uh, product. Okay, they you basically get pulp that's made from all kinds of grapes mm-hmm. that's reduced and put under pressure or control or, or uh, preserved with liquid nitrogen or mm-hmm. the vast quantity of chemicals you don't want in your body and then they sit in these massive vats and there's a and there's a global market for this stuff so it can come from anywhere chile china wherever okay then you add declarified or deflavored pear juice or apple juice mm-hmm. or you add distilled water to yeah. reconstitute it in the case of pear. so really what at what grape tizer and and those guys are are really soda pops made from 100 percent syrup Okay. 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 Yeah. Whereas yeah. what we press, <laughs> so you, so you're tasting. There's, you're, there's definitely a, a non grape tizer like taste that comes at you afterwards. Yeah. So I mean, you're through. you're actually tasting an estate grade product. It we we work with um we we work with wine uh, vintners who actually follow a winemaking process. The only thing you won't have in a glass of Latanda is the complexity, is the alcohol and the complexity that comes with aging from a barrel. Okay. Who came up with the name? I love it. Latanda, my wife and I. No, it couldn't no, have been no, your wife like and I. No, no, at the same time, like one, two, nah, three. Nah, bro, nah. nah, nah, nah. <laughs> <laughs> See, when a guy says We did it together. <laughs> when anyone says that, especially a, a married man, he's basically trying to take the props away from the wife. <laughs> He's basically trying to own props oh, that I don't see. belong to him. You came up with oh, the last. You came up with the tanda. tanda. There's no way you guys could have both come up with that. I might have come up with the name, to be honest. Mm. To 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 rebuff. Well, I don't know. I this, might is, this is, is going to have to do because it's your word. I, mean, I don't know. Yeah. I mean, my wife not will correct, will for correct me, you know, later. And there are three variants, isn't it? So so, so you got you got the 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 red, and then you got the white. Uh, so yes, yeah. we bottle a, a Muscat de Alexandria, and we bottle a Colombo, which is a French grape. French grape, unlike the uh, the Hunter Port, has a lower natural sugar content. Doesn't oh, go can. golden on the vine. Stays quite green even through ripening. That's amazing. And it's typically used in 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 various blends in in white wine blends. I'm and amazed at how much you know so much about these yeah. wine things, man. It's like you you you've been doing this for years. Well, we had to. We we got we worked with a, a wine master. We did classes. We had wow. to learn about the product. It took us a year to develop, and and yeah. So the other one's more uh, bubbly and more. A champagne style okay. concept, and this one is typically what you would drink with a meal. The other one is is great with like dessert or on its own for celebrations and stuff like that. So yeah, Latana is basically a play on Latana they loved, yeah. and ah. 
And that's how we discovered this business. I mean, we're on honeymoon in the Western Cape at, uh, at, uh, Sarah Wine Estate, easily one of the, the best wine estates to, to like, if, yeah, we haven't been back since because we haven't splurged like that. Uh, um, you know, locally, it, it's, it's tough to splurge, but it's really pretty wine estate, but they don't make, there are very few wine estates that make, uh, that follow like the old world process to making, to making grape juice, not using a factory process, right. um, uh, but using and using a state grade product, using single varietal grape juices from a wi- you know from award winning wine estates. That no one's really doing that anymore. Even Asara, mm. um, who have an amazing place and an ama- you know, apparently their wines are great too. But uh, so I, I'm interested. Sorry, to touch. You. So yeah, so yeah, um, that's that's how we discovered it. We we were on honeymoon and Latanda made sense. Nice. That when and this is the last thing we want to talk about with the wines. Yeah. Um, do you partner with somebody to create these or is it just you and your wife basically bank rolling and from the the whole process top yeah. down? Okay. So it's my wife and I. We basically okay. put in putting we put in our really our life savings to start the business. Okay. And the only reason it would have required about three or four times that amount to do it, in which case we wouldn't have been able to. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and really how it started was we went during our honeymoon, we went all over the you know, the 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 wine the winelands looking for pre- you know, wine estates that still produced the stuff. Mm-hmm. We found there are a handful and mm-hmm. we found some of the best and we brought it home and friends started to come over and they drink and they want it and we order for them. And, and within about six months or so, we sold like three, 400 bottles of other people's stuff. You have a lot of friends. Wow. That's a lot of friends. No, I mean, my wife and I do have people over quite a bit. At least we did at that time, point in our life. Yeah. But I mean, at the end of the day, people order like 12 yeah, cases great. of stuff from us. Wow. Yeah. And then, um, in working in television, I met a Canadian wine master and he owns like two fairly, you know, fairly big brands of yeah. wine in South Africa and exports thousands of liters of the stuff to, to the EU, Canada, where he's from. Mm. And we told him about this. I told him about this on the phone, just asking for his advice and stuff. Yeah. Like we told him what we were doing and what my wife and I were planning at the time was to open a site and have all these different brands available because mm-hmm. a lot of them aren't in retail and stuff like that. And he was like, why would you do that? Why would you open up a whole market that these people don't even have sites on? You guys are embedded in a, in a non-alcoholic drinking cult, a non-alcoholic culture yeah, yeah. that these people don't have sites on. They don't have inroads to the, the, you know, I mean, you would, I mean, you, they'd kill you if you tried to, to start a wine because they can take you on. But, but why would you open up? And, and all of these guys are calling us going, Hey, so, you know, what, what do you want to do for us? We'll, we'll give you, you know, but none of them would give us straight up agency over their brand. Mm-hmm. And also some of their packaging wasn't retail ready. And do you get what I'm saying? So he's like, why would you go through all that hell for other people's brands and bring them to market? You know, start your own. Start your own brand. Like, no, are you serious? Could we? And he's like, yeah, listen. So the only reason we were able to start this business the way we did is because this guy literally, we, he gave us, he said, here are your lawyers over there. All right. Shout out to you, DM Kitch. Um, uh, here your, here's your, here's the guys you need to use for, for courier. Here's mm-hmm. the guys you need to get like for long distance thingy. Amazing. Here's what, and whenever we'd start a relationship with these guys, here's who you use for packaging. Here's your, you know, which wine is well, he really set with. you guys up. He really set just gave you guys pointers. It, it was literally. And then he said, um, so we'd get in and he'd say, but yeah, but these, you know, we'd come back to him and say, but the, the, the courier said that the, this is the rate per bottle or per case they can afford or per, per pallet. And he's like, no, no, no. Quick scan mail, his terms, send them this mm-hmm. and tell them that's what you want. Wow. So we, he literally, we, we literally so leveraged he, his influence. He essentially became a mentor there and then and yeah. in a sense. Actually, we met him once and never again. He's never actually even seen the product. We never even met him after to show him the product. You said you met him during an interview. So I was doing an interview for It's My Biz, which is a show I used to yeah. do for ETN. And he was one of the mentors that had been brought on to, he, I mean, this guy is one of the sharpest individuals. Yeah. He's got like, he's a, he's got like a P, is this a, like a PhD in wine? He's got like an MBA. He's got like a, he's a CFA. He's just a maverick of note. He's, he's, he helped bring Nike. He helped, uh, uh, broker the finance that brought Nike to, to Africa as a brand. So, I mean, he, this guy is like, Crazy. It's interesting you say that, and and this is um something that's been uh, kind of top of mind for a while because being in a space like you were in interviewing people, um, it gives you access to people that you ordinarily wouldn't have had access yeah. to, and I think that was the case with um, given Kari and his people who now 
he owns Power FM and uh, you know a lot of other yeah. media entities. But a lot of those connections were made when he was hosting the show on um, radio Metro, station called Metro. Yeah, yeah. Um, and he met a lot of those people, and through those discussions, you know, a lot of these things uh, panned out that yeah. way. So access is uh, it's amazing it's when you get into spaces right, like that. Yeah, you know what really is. What I find very dope about what Andile just said is that there's a guy who's obviously well established, well schooled. He knows his his field, his arena, and he's willing to share that knowledge. He's willing to share the networks. He's willing to share the access and all the years worth of experience he's had just to a guy who he just met once. Do you know what I mean? And that kind of attitude for me, that kind of generosity of of purpose and of will, of resources, of networks is something that I find not not lacking but very rare yeah. you know especially at the highest level of achievement where there are people who are willing to just share their nuggets of knowledge just because they can do you know what I mean yeah. and and he went a step further he actually championed your cause when he was actually allowing other people to deal with you in a specific way and open doors for you you know I find that to be amazing you know I mean so when I say we met once I tell him the idea over the phone or I email him and then I speak to him over the phone. And when he hears the idea, he invites us to Inanda club, which is like fa- a fancy polo, polo club here in Johannesburg, like members only that kind of vibe. Uh, he invites us for lunch there and, and basically takes us to lunch, this fancy lunch listens to what we want to do and then says this no is quid how. pro quo he doesn't uh, want anything in the back he doesn't want any BEE sort of like license no stake in your business like nothing no, no, no. in fact he what he did guarantee that we never took him up on because we we changed our um uh, our, our thinking about it we we want initially we thought we'd want to get in all the restaurants and stuff like that but that was going to be a logistical nightmare for a small brand mm-hmm. so he had even offered that some of the restaurants he owns he put us you know he put us why do you there. think he was so keen to be that gracious and to be that helpful for you guys was it because he liked you he thought you guys had a nice face it's like oh look at this pretty face couple that's in front of me interested in my business and just also to add on to Zub's yeah. question do you also kind of believe in that philosophy of one good turn deserves another. So you, you pay it back, uh, in, in a sense, you know, paid okay, forward. Yeah. I certainly do believe that being kind and generous for its own sake. Yeah. Um, it is, is important, right? So doing, like doing it for, for reasons beyond like self interest mm-hmm. is definitely a, a great way to live. I've definitely seen in my life how even when I had selfish intentions, when I, I've seen many times when um, I was generous with my time or, or, you know, my insight or my whatever. I've seen how it's, 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 it's repaid itself, you know, many times over. So, I mean, there's obviously selfish reasons to do it and non-selfish reasons. Mm-hmm. And I prefer the non-selfish reasons, but I, I mean, I won't pretend that there are no benefits, even just from a, you know, strategic positioning standpoint. And, right. you know, I, and I hear what you're saying, Zabas, in terms of like, you know, people aren't as free. I've, I've experienced both. Mm-hmm. Um, I find the the people with I f- I find a lack of generosity in people who actually uh, the lack of generosity tends to 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 happen in in people who actually haven't succeeded. Mm. People feel entitled, perhaps entitled or uh, intimidated. They, they they misunderstand how success comes about. And, and and so to unpack that a little bit, the idea is this. We hear the, the, the popular notion is that people like Bill Gates, Oprah Winfrey and whatever, they, they're just super talented. And like if Bill Gates, like he, he can hack and Mark Zuckerberg is just super clever and they just ditch uh, varsity and they just yeah. go create these big. And, and Oprah Winfrey is just smart and she's a great interviewer. And, her, and what people don't realize in, that in these oversimplified stories of success, and locally we have the same thing. I don't know what people believe, Patrice Motsepe or, you know, Dangote or they, whatever they believe about all these, you know, super successful people. I think most people buy into the notion that, um, they buy into an oversimplified story about how success comes about. Mm. They don't take into account the the person's uh, society, the people who have invested in them, um, whether knowingly or otherwise, if every teacher they've had, every school they were lucky enough to be, being born in the right city, mm-hmm. um, being born to the right family, or, you know, having a relative who, who said the one thing that would send you off in a direction you never would have gone on your own, um, you know, meeting someone who would share a business tip that saves you millions. Yeah. So people don't realize how important 
a, a sense a, like community, the role of community, your environment, your there are all these king making and queen making uh, 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 factors. Uh, no, uh, what is it? Uh, t- um, ingredients. Ingredients or uh, uh, influencing factors, factors mm. that go into into making someone succeed at anything. I agree. And to not see how it serves you to to be of service to other people, especially in this new media, in this sort of digitized environment. Like, if you haven't figured out a way to be consistently of value to your network you will die a slow death because you'll you'll be starved of the very insights and values that you need to actually grow and become the success you've always wanted to be. So I find like there, there's a misunderstanding around that. People think, okay, if I, if I have like, if it's, it, it feels like, uh, and Americans teach us this in their movies, and it feels like uh, success is all about executing on advantage and dog yeah. eat dog and, you know, and at the highest possible level, there's a lot of cooperation. There's a lot of generosity yeah. There's a lot of trust. I was going to say, link linked to what you're saying now, yeah. you tweeted something, so we've been trolling you. Oh, okay. <laughs> what was the tweet? It's linked to gratitude. You yeah. said, uh, what, what you said, we've got to have it right paper. here, man. Mm. No gratitude, no peace. No gratitude, no peace. Do you remember that tweet you sent? Or you just send, you send random know. tweets? So, if there's one thing you, uh, as a value, yeah. Um, I decided quite early when I joined Twitter that um, I would. Like following me had to add value. Nice. Yeah. I struggle, I struggle with that platform, to be honest, because I always see myself as like, well, why would you want to follow me? Are you a fan of my music and my music career? Mm. Is there something you want to know about what I'm doing musically? What do you want to hear from mm. me? So what you're saying is a very interesting thing. Yeah. I, I want to add value yeah. through my timeline. People need to saying. think about, and I think everyone needs to think. I believe, I believe that, uh, we have a white space opportunity as Africans because of where we are in terms of the adoption curve, in right. terms of digital and everything. So many of us, you guys included, who have access to these digital tools and platforms. Anybody who picks or identifies a value that they can contribute to their network yeah. consistently uh, needs to package it in a clever way. For some, it'll be tweets. For others, it'll be podcasts. Yeah. You know, Instagram vlogs, vlogs Instagram. Vlogs, yeah. So identify it doesn't have to be one thing, but for a lot of people, it can be one thing at least to start. Yeah, and then do it systematically and consistently for a hundred weeks in a row. You will not be in a hundred weeks time where you started off. Yeah, by default, that's a white space opportunity that doesn't exist in the Western world where there's so so much noise. Yeah, you know, here we are an elite. You know, we're an elite privileged to be in a position to be followed, to consistently act on a on yeah. a value proposition. Do you get what I'm saying? It takes right. a lot of time and money and effort and disposable income to even think, or to even have the space to think about a concept like you guys have done here. Yeah. Do you get what I'm saying? Yeah, true. And never mind, act on it consistently for 100 weeks 100 in a row. Weeks. And you guys do that. You will not, by default, whether you get picked up by a, a network, whether a thousand people follow you, or not, I don't know what shape or form it'll come, mm-hmm. but you will, like, there will be a value that, you know, you will personally derive in terms of the brand, the brand you're building or the ideas you're building. Mm-hmm. And so from a gratitude standpoint, um, I said, I, I realized in the morning I got up that morning and I can't remember what scripture I'd read, um, that, uh, it, it was script. It was scriptural based, and I can't remember the scripture. It's a pity, but I re- I realized that a lot of our peace comes from a perpetual discontentment with mm-hmm. where we we feel we should be at in life. Yeah. Like there's this perpetual, and there's fancy names for it, like FOMO or this mm-hmm. or whatever. And really, all that is is this perpetual societally celebrated sense of it, ne- there's you've never got enough, right? And and that is in turn fueled by a, 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 a failure to realize just how amazing your situation is your currently. Your situation is currently. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. And of course, you know, so I mean, and, and I can speak to you guys direct in terms of that because I know just how we are not the average Africans. We are not the average world citizens by yeah. many metrics. Income. The fact that we had a meal this morning, access, the networks we enjoy, the fact that we're in voiceover work, we've got successful careers in media. Mm. I mean, so, and there's no peace 
until you actively acknowledge that in your life. And and in my case, really just thank God for for his grace in that regard. I love that. Okay. Yeah. I think let's wrap it up. Before yeah. we wrap it up though, Andile, yeah. I want us to do like a quick rapid fire quick okay. question and answer. Q and A yeah. very quickly because yeah. we've run out of time. I haven't even given you guys a good interview here. I don't even know. No, this is it's amazing. We like We're probably gonna chop out like ninety five percent of what you said. <laughs> All right, yeah. Pretty We're gonna include a hundred percent of what I said. <laughs> yeah. Maybe two percent of what Chilu is. It's your show. <laughs> Your show. They include my nah, laughs in there. Yeah, we just have Chidu's laughs. That's <laughs> it. <laughs> it's your, it's your show. Nah, man, it's, it's been great. I've right. loved it. Um, so real quick, yeah, no sentences. If you have one word answers, that's even better. Even yeah. Better. If you want to elaborate on the answer, go ahead. Right. But I'm gonna ask you. This is very simple. Five questions. You know, are you ready? It's, it's not a test, by the way. Okay. You can't fail yeah, or pass this. Test. All right, we're gonna start easy. Indoors or outdoors? Outdoors. Okay. If you want clarity, like I said, anything. No, no, it makes sense. Kendrick Lamar or Drizzy Drake? Oh, Kendrick. Okay, okay, okay. Love or passion? It's getting harder now. Love, right? definitely. Love, definitely? Definitely. Why? I'm going to expand on this one. And don't, love, don't be long. Hey? No paragraphs. Love is a choice. And love takes effort. Love takes time. Uh, passion is fleeting. Um... Passion changes, or, or, or passion shifts, and passion can be misplaced, right? So they're mm-hmm. passions that we have no business fanning because yeah. they're destructive, mm-hmm. right? So whereas love, yeah, there's there's there are no losers in love, right? I love that. You can feel like yeah, you can feel like you're taking the L because of love, but very really, and and I mean the real thing, not the oh. I, I love know. something not that kind of yeah love. no no I'm talking about the real deal the love that sticks around love that doesn't um, take offense that doesn't keep a record of wrongs I'm talking mm-hmm. that kind of love so I'm talking love is patient love, love is kind, kind. Yeah, 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 yeah I'm talking that love, love. not um, I used to love if it's I used to love then with, well, you're talking about something else right or I used to love or because the real yeah. kind of love is the love that lasts yeah it's infinity forgiving love. Um, long suffering. Wicked. So okay. yeah, definitely that over passion, right? Of course. Yeah. Two more wisdom or wealth? Wisdom. Man after Solomon's heart. Yeah. I know, but Solomon had both, like, didn't he? Yeah. Solomon had wisdom and wealth. That's what I'm saying is if you got wealth, you can always surround yourself with wise folk that might, you know, osmosis <laughs> vibes. Uh, osmosis have some wisdom. The rules of engagement of this rabbit fire question, you didn't even have the My choice. Bad. You, you okay. could have said both. Yeah, no. if you oh, want no, to. No, you, no, 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 it's true, it's true. No, no, you can't say both. There's no right or wrong. Um, I've but got a new relationship with wealth in my life. It's, uh, and that wealth, and wealth, my desire, for, my desire for wealth at this stage in my life really has more to do with my desire to uh, allow my wife never have, to never have to worry about our financial situation. Mm. You're saying about wisdom and wealth. Let's just pick up from wisdom or health. Wisdom is better than silver, silver or gold. gold. I can't remember the next line. What a sight really to dope. behold. Yeah, it's a Lauren Hill, man. <laughs> but I, I, got, I got a rhyme in, though. Yeah, yeah, you did get a rhyme. You can't come on this show and not get a rhyme in. Especially because when I met Andy Le, it was because of the rhymes that brought us together. Yeah, and that's amazing, man. I never I never figured you for, for a hip hop head. Well, I, would, I wouldn't say I am. Oh, but but, but I would say the I'm, important hip hop artists resonate with you. I would say I very rarely meet people with as eclectic taste as I have. Right. And, um, and, and, and Lauren Hill has to be by far my favorite. I don't even want to say female MC of all yeah. time. I'd say if it wasn't for Lauren Hill, I wouldn't, uh, on some level, I wouldn't be into hip hop at all. Mm. On some level. You know, I totally I've that. appreciated things here and there, but Lauren Hill, yeah, she no, like brought you in. in. Yeah, she, and and she taught me what she idealized what hip hop should be yeah, for me. Right. So anyway, Lauren's um, amazing. Wait, wait, she's does, amazing. Yeah, she's incredible. Um, but wealth and I think the problem with wealth and, and the wisdom question, real quick, is just I think people feel like um, a vote for wisdom is. Especially when you watch what hip hop is and the culture yeah. we're sold and right. you know materialism, it all it almost doesn't make it, it. Wisdom doesn't seem to to promote the ideals it, it, like our society strives for right now. No, okay. yeah, no. It, actually, acting the fool seems to deliver that to more more consistently. Very true, yeah. So Very true. and then and then it also speaks to a stunted idea we have about wealth. You know, and yeah. what that looks or even feels like. Mm. So I, p- I pick 10 millennials, pick 10 Generation Z, 
Z people or kids yeah. right now and ask them what it means to be wealthy or rich. Yeah. And chances are the reason I'd pick wisdom over wealth is simply because their definition of wealth is irrelevant to me. Mm-hmm. And I, I could actually live an entirely fulfilled, purposeful life without any of the stuff that they think they die for. I know. You know, so totally that's how I think about it. Yeah. Okay, final in our rapid fire question. This is the hardest of them all. Yeah. Beef or chicken? Sorry, beef or chicken? Beef or chicken? Chicken these days. Um, and less so, my wife and I, we're eating less and less meat. Red meat? Both. Or meat? Yeah, I mean, we still eat everything. I mean, we had goat the other night. My, my goat? Yeah, <laughs> goat's like greatest of all time. Listen, my mom came over to our house and she started cooking goat. And my wife was tripping because, you know, she, I mean, where would she know goat eating from? At oh, least well. Chilu in Zambia vibes. You know how we roll yeah. in Zambia. We Nigerians cook goat. are the biggest goat you know, Yo, know we've been that. eating goat. Anyway, we yeah, can, it's we, the we most goat. underrated red, domesticated red meat out there. What lamb, ch- mutton? Come on, the aroma in the house is amazing when but you're also, cooking yeah, goat. But also, like, no, but just from a complexity standpoint, like yeah. in terms of like what it delivers, like from a, I mean, people like hunt venison and they do all this stuff. I'm like goats right there, bruh. Eat that goat, bro. But having that go- no, anyway. So <laughs> no, no, but we're eating less meat because it's just um, the like profound health benefits that I've been exp- well, my wife and I have both been experiencing because of having less sort of mm. meat in our diets nice. and, and that's something we want to do more and more of you and your wife are really on yeah. like the yeah. path I man I see another brand coming up that's Latanda the- Eco Yay. Eating or something Yay. In Jesus name. <laughs> hey. All right, listen. Before you go, I want you. I want. I want you to just summarize uh, very quickly, very briefly. Yeah. Um, your dad's Africa, mm. and I, I'll include them both. Your mom and your dad, because they're both PhD. They wanted you to go follow this life. You know, very specific life where they say, "What do you do?" I am a PhD. Oh, my dad. To be fair. Mm. Okay, so your dad. Your dad's view of Africa and your dad's Africa, mm. and. Your Africa, Andile's oh, Africa. Deep one, dude. No, you don't get to have an hour with this one. Okay. You get to have literally so forty-five my dad's seconds. Africa versus my grandfather Ndumo was dispossessed of his land and cattle. He was a very wealthy man. Thousand cattle. Um, land laws changed in Zimbabwe. He had to scatter his herd. Uh, and my father was the last born of of one of his three, one of the three women he had children with. And because all most of my father's siblings stood to inherit Ndumo's wealth, mm. they didn't need school. They didn't, you know I mean, they prost- like they lived a lot of their lives, at least up until sort of maybe 10, 11, 12, 13, mm. as kids who stood to inherit Ndumo's wealth. And then life changed. Mm. And my father to this day actually is the only Per- is the only person in his immediate family, half brothers, half sisters, with a, with a, with a, with a university qualification. And so when I see how education fundamentally changed the world, what, what, it changed things for my, for my, fa- for my father, mm. like literally put, literally put shoes on his feet, literally took him in some situations from having sadza or, you know, pap and yeah. trala and, and salty water to, to it, when I see how it changed, how like a technology, like the written book, Right. Like the written word and knowing how to say your name, mm. you know, and then write, you write your name and, sign, and put a signature. When I see how those things change, I, it, I totally understand why my dad wants me to have a PhD. Of course. Because in his mind, it's a proxy for everything that allowed him to leave behind the worst parts of what it meant to be a, a repressed, a repressed majority. Mm. And so, yeah. And in, in that regard, like juxtapose that with, Andile's Africa. So what I tell my father often when I feel like he's pushing a little too hard, Dad, I'm getting the masters done. Okay, I'm at Vitz, I'm doing the thing. Um, but yeah, it's coming. You know what I mean? And, <laughs> and the reason I waited so long to do the masters is because it had to be a masters one that would make sense in terms of the investment. I was. I'm not a corporate animal that's going to get his company to pay for it. Mm-hmm. Also, it has to be learnings that I can apply directly to the work I'm doing. Hence, the masters in interactive digital media I'm doing with Vitz and the research I'm doing there. Nice. And and so I said to my father, I am building on a foundation that you created. I would not be able to do or have the options or exercise the options and the opportunities. I would not, you know, I would not have this had it not been for the layer of opportunity that you created. And I feel that my father is now coming into an understanding of 
just how much of an advantage growing up Jewish or growing up white is in regards to being able to actually sit down, decide what we're going to do mm-hmm. and go try and do it. Whether you, you know, and then if that doesn't work, pick yourself up, gather everything you've learned and decide what to do next and do that. And that's not an, that's not a, that's not a way of life. My parents had the liberty of exercising. You get, you get, you get, it had to be a sure thing. Yeah. It had to be a degree that would get you into the job so you could get a house and get, get the others through school. And I, there are a lot of those burdens that aren't mine any longer. And I get to exercise a freedom that only exists because he had only so many options. Wicked. I think that's the most amazing thing. That is totally amazing. You know what I mean? So that's why, again, how you, how can you not be grateful? Mm. Gratitude, How can you not? Right? Mm. Like I'm Dumo's grandson and sitting in Santon are. in this flipping amazing setup <laughs> talking to my Zim brother and my Zim. Oh, come on! <laughs> Andilemasuku.com, right? Andilemasuku.com. You said that so well, man. You can drop the mic. Oh, oh wait, wait, wait. Not this one. <laughs> that will be a couple of thousand dollars. We're, we're not on an African tech roundup level yet. African tech roundup. That's the African podcast. Tech Roundup.com. Check us out. We're andilemasugu.com. Andy Find your boy. Twitter, Twitter Masugu Andile, my name and surname. Wicked. Those pesky early adopters beat me to my own name. Congratulations on Latanda. And, hey. you know, God bless you and your wife even Dude, more. I receive it. You know what I mean? Um, yeah, yeah. Bigger and better things. Thanks a lot for your contribution. Yeah. I look to up podcast, to you, boys. Bro. You guys are my brothers and I appreciate you. And thank you for having me on. No, man, yeah, of course you, you on again. To us, man. I mean, how can you not? <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> no, nah, I'm yeah. kidding. Now, thank you so much for helping us build this thing um, and for all your contributions so far, you know, and we look forward to doing some more cool stuff with you. Sure, man. Sure. Yes, yeah, Key Africans Unlocked. You want to say something real yeah, quick man. before we... Ah, firstly, we... can we just address how cool that name is? Key Africans Come Unlocked. Come on. Who yeah. came up with that? Was it, was it your wife? She's also... <laughs> she's, she's not... A, she's You're not bringing a, the Latanda thing also. back here. <laughs> key Africans Unlocked. <laughs> she came up with it the same way your wife came up with Latanda oh. wife. That's Oh, snap. Oh, snap. It might have been her. I have to say, I can't remember. Nah, there was no, there was, was there was a lot of brainstorming, and everybody contributed to it. We but all came ultimately up. the last letter. <laughs> Had the last yeah. say. Yeah, he exercised. He exercised his gift. I did. Is yeah. anything you want to say in closing? Yes, yes. Yeah. I want to thank the team, okay. man. We we've had uh, an awesome team uh, helping us to get to this stage, yeah, Mr. Man. Moots. Yeah. Zam and Sipo. Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah. Shout oh, out to yeah. everybody behind the scenes. Yeah. Uh it's been real. So uh yeah, that's about it. Thanks for coming through, bro. Thanks, man. Peace. Yeah. I'm gonna drink some more of this. Alright. <laughs>